a new series on Canadian foreign policy titled uh, Truth to the Powerless, an investigation into Canada's foreign policy. And uh, Bill Graham interviewed a bunch of, uh, interviewed in it a bunch about Canada's role in Haiti, about Iraq, about Afghanistan, uh, on issues that he, he played a role in, um, in determining. And um, this, uh, this uh, new uh, six, it's a six part series. I think the shortest one is maybe half an hour and the longest one is about an hour um, uh, delves into the history of Canadian foreign policy, the creation of NATO, then it has one entirely devoted to Haiti and, uh, and Latin America today, uh, Honduras, Venezuela, then it has another on uh, the war in Libya, uh, the first Iraq war, Afghanistan, another one. Uh, and um, it's a very, it's a really important, really important, uh, it just came out about a week ago. Uh, I think that um, I'm going to have on the uh, the uh, producer uh, uh, soon, uh, and if it actually wasn't for what's going on in Gaza, that I, I would have today. Uh, but people can check that out again. It's Truth to the Powerless: An Investigation into Canada's Foreign Policy, and it's a six-part series. Uh, people, uh, there's a he he interviews a number of the people uh, uh, ministers that were responsible for policy. Uh, some. Uh, ambassadors, but then he also talks to. I, I'm I'm interviewed a number of times. Uh, people like Tyler, Justin Pador, Richard Sanders, uh, Linda Friedman, Freeman, uh, people like that that have done you know critical stuff. David Webster, and 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 I think the it, what's one of the things that's interesting about this is that it it I think it somewhat reflects the growth of. I think I was talking about this last week or the week before the growth of. Uh, critical voices on Canadian foreign policy. Let's call them radical, if you want to call them anti-imperialist or genuinely internationalist or genuinely anti-racist, whatever you want to call those voices. Um, this this film uh, obviously amplifies those voices, but also I think that the ability to pull it off is because there are people, uh, you know, sort of talking heads, if you like, uh, that are that are. Um, Sort of uh, knowledgeable about all all of these domains of Canadian foreign policy. So it's a, it's a good. Uh, not only is it a good contribution in and of itself, I think it reflects the fact that we're very marginal, no doubt, but we are starting to build a bit of a, um, a, a you know again radical left, if you want to call it that, uh, uh, Canadian foreign policy uh, understanding. Uh, so that's kind of the good news of, of, uh, of, of today's, uh, today's session. And uh, of course, we have had a lot of developments, I think, that are, that are not good news. Uh, for instance, last week, we, of course, had a discussion of uh, Taiwan and Canada-China relations. And unsurprisingly, the uh, Liberal government has basically uh, come out um, not criticizing Nancy Pelosi's visit to, to Taiwan, not criticizing the fact that there are U.S. Um, bases all around China and all kinds of provocative maneuvers Americans have pursued, but instead criticizing the Chinese for their militaristic response to Pelosi's uh, visit. And of course, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not keen on, you know, military exercises that are designed to, um, to threaten Taiwan, which is clearly what, what China has done in response to uh to the visit by Pelosi, which of course is tied to a broader American uh, undermining of the one China policy and more general sort of uh, targeting of China. But uh, the Canadian government by uh, simply criticizing the Chinese is, uh, is helping the Americans in their, uh, in their campaign. So that's uh, not not surprising, uh, but uh, unfortunate. And even I just saw Heather McPherson, NDP foreign affairs critic, she just put out a tweet a couple hours ago, where she is basically uh, cheerleading that that policy of let's let's we got to stand up for Taiwan right now. This kind of similar kind of rhetoric to the uh, to the Ukraine uh, uh, file, and um, you know it's framed as you know defending Taiwan's sovereignty, but it's as likely to lead to um, uh, Taiwan being uh, being uh, destroyed, um, 
and it's unfortunate to see the NDP foreign affairs critic uh, uh, joining that, but they've been kind of taking that um, the uh, the uh, U.S. neocon position on on China more generally. Also, a couple of days ago, I think it was on Thursday, uh, uh, Defense Minister Anita Anand announced that Canada was sending uh, uh, 225 troops to the UK to train uh, UK forces. Basically, they were going to restart Operation Unifier, which was Canada's training mission that uh, ended just before the, uh, the uh, brutal and uh, illegal uh, Russian uh, invasion of February 24th. And uh, the dispatching of Canadian troops to uh, Ukraine, uh, restarting Operation Unifier is, is, um, uh, is a, you know, this is what Operation Unifier was, was Canada's most important contribution to the, well, really, I think should be understood as a seven year proxy war with Russia. You know, we, Russia was backing uh, the, the, um, the, I don't know if you call them independence or, or um, the anti kiev forces within the Donbass. And, um, and Canada was backing the Ukrainian military and, uh, and Operation Unifier was the main way. Canada became, according to uh, Petro Poroshenko, the, the godfather of the Ukrainian, uh, modern Ukrainian military was Jason Kenney. That's what he said back in 2019. Jason Kenney was Canada's defense minister when Operation Unifier was announced and Operation Unifier served to undermine the, uh, the Minsk II Accord. Um, and, um, and so, uh, and obviously led to, you know, fighting, prolonging the, the fighting in the East. And then to a certain extent, at least that, you know, the Russian full fledged Russian invasion is somewhat, you know, in part a response to that, that, whole, uh, that whole dynamic. And so here you have the Canadian government that is now restarting Operation Unifier, which is, there's a, a, a couple of, I think, negative uh, signals that's sending. First of all, this is happening, of course, when the Canadian government will not use the word peace, will not use the word negotiation. That is absolutely, you know, outside of the lexicon of Canadian officials vis-a-vis -vis the war in Ukraine. And it's... Um, the, the training mission is taking place while also actually uh, on Thursday, Global News confirmed what the New York Times reported, I guess, maybe uh, six weeks ago, which is that there are Canadian special forces on the ground in Ukraine and, and a number of uh, sources within the Canadian Special Forces Command uh, uh, admitted that uh, off the record to Global News. And so it's just, this is a further deepening of Canada's war with Russia. Uh, we obviously have uh, Canada providing military intelligence. That's something that doesn't get enough attention. And apparently Canada is going to be <clears throat> assisting the Ukrainian uh, troops that are going to be training in the UK with uh, using communication security establishment, which is Canada's uh, version of the NSA, using their uh, cyber intelligence um, in, their, in their operations against the Russians. We, uh, of course, have major weapons deliveries. We have former Canadian soldiers uh, fighting, uh, encouraged by the Canadian government. We have aggressive sanctions. We have seizing of Russian assets. You, you can have a situation, at least in theory, where you have a Canadian trained soldier using Canadian weaponry, using Canadian provided military intelligence, fighting next to a former Canadian soldier that has gone to fight in Ukraine. Um, that's a pretty heavy uh, involvement in this, in this war. Also, I think Operation Unifier is really confirming that they, they expect this to go on for a long time. We're talking probably years, years to go. Uh, so that's a you know, very disturbing uh, sign um, there. On the, on the counter to that, uh, one of our members uh, that, are, that is participating tonight, uh, uh, Laurel uh, Thompson and uh, Dimitri Lascaris, uh, disrupted uh, Melanie Jolie, Foreign Minister Jolie, and the uh, German Foreign Minister last week uh, on Wednesday at the uh, Sheraton Hotel here in Montreal over NATO, NATO expansionism, and the, um, the aggressive policies. So, so there's a little bit of a dissent Far from enough, of course, but a little bit of dissent towards Canada's policy on uh, 
<clears throat> fighting um, in the Ukraine and war with Russia. So tomorrow is the anniversary, 77th anniversary of the American bombing of uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki was uh, two days ago. And I think it's good to, uh, in this moment, point out that can the Canadian government with its policy in Ukraine, with its policy on uh, Taiwan is increasing the likelihood of another similar type nuclear uh, war use. And at the same time, the Canadian government is uh, not, refuses to sign the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. There's the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, Review Conference taking place in New York. I believe it began on, on August 1st, on Monday of last week. The UN Secretary General said that humanity was one mistake away from a, a nuclear annihilation. I believe that's the exact quote, nuclear annihilation. Um, and the Canadian government, from what I can tell, you know, there's no state, it was no statement from no minister attended. US Secretary of State and the German foreign minister actually attended at least. Whether they're you know taking it seriously, that's a whole other question, but but they at least attended. Nothing, no Canadian minister, from what I can tell, no Canadian statement. If you if you look deep on uh on um, the UN account, Canada's Twitter account, there is one or two uh, brief tweets about the fact that negotiations or that the review conference uh, began, uh, but very little um, political um, interest by the Canadian government. So on one hand, it's you know, pushing conflicts vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, Russia, vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, China, that increased the likelihood of nuclear weapons use. And at the, on the other side, it's um, it's refusing to really engage with the um, the efforts to uh, uh, ban or at least uh, reduce the proliferation of uh, of nuclear um, uh, uh, weapons. So, alongside uh, some of these developments, on uh, Friday, uh, Israel began a another of its many many uh, attacks or onslaughts on the besieged uh, population in Gaza. I think the, the latest figures, they'll probably increase, uh, 44 dead, 60, including 16 children, and uh, a few hundred injured, more than 300 injured, uh, probably thousands who've uh, lost a home, lost a business, lost property. Obviously, many, many children, uh, once again, traumatized uh, by these uh, Israeli bombing campaigns in Gaza. And um, the Canadian government's statement, the only thing they said on it was the, uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Twitter account. Uh, so, so very uh, low down on, on the diplomatic chain. They put out a statement saying, quote, Canada mourns the civilian loss of life due to the violence in Israel and Gaza. Canada supports Israel's right to assure its own security while respecting human rights and international law. We urge all parties to de-escalate tensions and protect civilians. Um, so Israel basically just decided to do this. They were trying to goad uh, Palestinians into uh, some sort of uh, uh, conflict for, for a number of days. Um, uh, and uh, finally, eventually, they just you know uh, killed a uh, Palestinian, Palestinian Islamic Jihad uh, leader. Where, where you know killed a five-year-old girl and um, I think ten, nine or ten other people in that in that bomb. And uh, basically, um, you know, we're looking looking for a fight. And this this is not new. This is this is uh, this is a regular um, occurrence. Basically almost annually since, since uh, the last 15 years, um, more than 5,000 Palestinians, about around 5,000 Palestinians have been killed in these different assaults and, uh, and a huge amount of property destruction, um, kids traumatized. And the, the, it's important to note that Palestinians in Gaza are, are you know, the most oppressed Palestinians. 
um, most of them were driven there in 1947, 48, and they were ethnically cleansed from what is now uh, Israel. And they, they've been under this, you know, from 67 to 2005, Israel formally occupied, and there was a small number of uh, Israeli settlers in, in Gaza. And since 2005, they've been under a, uh, a blockade, uh, more or less the whole time since 2005. And the, the uh, Canadian government has been deeply complicit in this whole process. Uh, first of all, voting against UN resolutions that most of the world support that criticize the blockade. The, the Canada has actually participated in this initiative to enforce uh, the blockade. The Canadian government played a role in legitimating the whole blockade by being the first country after Palestinian legislative elections in 2006, where Hamas won, that I think everyone agrees, you know, fair and square, that the Canadian government immediately announced they were cutting off aid to the Palestinians. Then they refused to recognize the Palestinian unity government. And basically what they were trying to do is they were trying to stoke conflict between Fatah and Hamas, the two main Palestinian political factions. And they succeeded, and it led to a uh, to a, a, a sort of low-level uh, civil war. And we, am, amidst that, Hamas took control of Gaza, and that has been Hamas's control of Gaza has been, in large part, what the Israelis used to justify their siege blockade, which basically turns this this densely populated area of 2.2 million or so people live into a open air prison where the Israelis control the, the sea, the uh, passage by sea, by air. Uh, they, they, you know, create no-go zones around the edges and they, you know, regularly, they, when there's pal peaceful Palestinian resistance, they, you know, Israeli snipers uh, in 2018 and 2019 killed more than 200, injured more than 5,000. And, and, uh, I mean, it's a it's a it's a shocking, shocking situation. And in the last three days, there's now a ceasefire. But the last three days, Israel has you know just once again ramped up its um, its violence. And and so so part of, again part of how they justify all this is is on the grounds of Hamas or the in the case of recent days, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad as being terrorist organizations. So if you go on to uh, Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs or Friends of Simon Weisenthal Center Canada uh, Twitter accounts, they justify, immediately they justify what Israel is doing is that Palestinian Islamic Jihad is a, is a, listed, a listed terrorist organization in Canada. So we can, we can terrorize 2.2 million people because this is a listed terrorist organization in Canada. They've done similar to when it was they were supposedly targeting Hamas. Same thing. It's a listed terrorist organization, so we can you know kill as many Palestinians as we want. And so Canada has played an important role in this. It's terrorist list. I, I just published a piece making this point, arguing this point. Canada's terrorist list, at least vis-a-vis -vis Israel Palestine, it enables terrorism. It enables Israeli state terrorism. And uh, it's it's a it's a you know uh, quite a odious uh, propaganda exercise, uh, but but that is that is um, that is what's uh, 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 going on uh, in in recent days and in, in recent weeks, and and so with eight there's eight Palestinian groups listed as terrorist organizations in this country, so m most of Palestinian political life. Uh, all resistance is deemed as as terrorist in Canada. Worse than that, in 2014, the International Relief Fund for the Afflicted and Needy, which was a Mississauga-based uh, charity, it got it was the first Canadian group to be listed as a Canadian-based group to be listed as a, a terrorist organization. It, it actually it, about four or five years earlier, it had its charitable status cut off, and then it was listed as a charity terrorist organization because it was providing, it provided dialysis machine to a hospital in Gaza and it was supporting orphans in Gaza. Both of those, the money was being channeled through the post office, which after Hamas took control of Gaza, the 
post office under Hamas's control. So we were, they were, the group was assisting a terrorist organization. And the health ministry was under Hamas's control. So the dialysis machine was, was again, deemed as assisting a terrorist organization. So, so lost their charitable status and then got listed as a terrorist organization in this country for, for supporting orphans in a hospital in Gaza. And this just, you know, is a window into the shocking double standard of, of uh, Canadian policy and how Canada enables Israel's isolation and, and you know, as, it, as they put it, mowing of the lawn in Gaza, which is, means, you know, terrorizing people and killing people whenever they decide they want to mow the lawn. And the Canadian government has, you know, supports this. And they, you, through the terrorist list, but also through our support for the IDF, you have recruitment for the IDF in contravention of Canadian law that takes place in Canada. You have charities that raise money, tens of millions of dollars, projects that support the Israeli military. Uh, that's taxpayer subsidized that contravenes Canada Revenue Agency rules. You have Canadian weapon sales to Israel, and you have all kinds of other differing forms of relations between the Canadian military and the Israeli military. Uh, historically, there's some interesting points to Canada's contribution to, obviously, to Palestinian dispossession. That's a huge discussion, and we can get into all that. Uh, but more specifically, around Gaza, there's actually a Canadian Royal Military College uh, graduate after leading the conquering of, uh, of uh, taking control of part of West Africa uh, from the Germans and giving it to, uh, to uh, Togo, Togo um, to the uh, British and the American or British and the French during, um, during World War I, Charles McPherson Doble led the uh, 1917 sec second battle for Gaza. Hundreds of Canadians fought in the third battle for Gaza under Allenby British general, the they employed uh, uh, chemical weapons uh, in the in those battles for for Gaza. Um, more significantly, as I mentioned, uh, Canada or, or most most Palestinians living in Gaza, they they were driven out. They were ethnically cleansed from their homes in 47, 48 by the Zionist forces. Canada played a really important role in the partition plan at the UN that legitimated the, the Zionist ethnic cleansing. And basically there's two different ways. Lester Pearson, Canadian diplomat at the time, played an important role in two different UN committees that, that created the partition plan and then pushed partition afterwards. And Ivan C. Rand, Canadian Supreme Court Justice uh, was is considered the lead architect of the partition plan. And the one point Ivan Rand uh, wanted to give uh, more Palestinian land to the Zionist movement than even the Zionist movement was officially asking for. So he was very, you know, had a very macro uh, view of the partition plan. And what the partition plan did was it gave 55% of historic Palestine to the Zionist movement, even though the Zionist movement owned less than 7% of land, the Jewish population was, was uh, slightly below a third of, of the people living there. So from a Palestinian perspective, it was incredibly unjust. It, of course, was just unjust that, that there was going to be, you know, a Canadian Supreme Court justice was going to be part of deciding what happened to their country, right? And this is what the partition uh, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine was, was a bunch of international officials that went to Palestine to come up with a proposal for the British mandate. So, so from a Palestinian perspective, this was all, this all made no sense to them. And then what, what actually was put forward um, was, was very unjust. And, and, it, and it, by, by the UN giving its stamp of approval to a, a Jewish state on most of historic Palestine, even though again, most of the population were Palestinians, that legitimated the Zionist movement's known plan to drive out Palestinians. I mean, you can't have a Jewish state on a mostly non-Jewish area, right? I mean, it, it's just, and the, the Zionist movement understood that openly in the 1930s that they were sort of privately, semi-privately that they, they had to, uh, they were gonna have to, uh, do something about the uh, the indigenous uh, uh, population. 
So, so Canada has a historic contribution and many others, I can get into, go on about all the different uh, historic contributions uh, to Palestinian dispossession, but specifically to understanding um, what's going on in Gaza today, that again, most of the population are, are descendants of those who were, who were driven out in uh, 47, 48, and Canada uh, played a role in, um, in legitimating that whole uh, uh, process. So, when we when we look at you know the injustice of what Israel is doing today and the injustice of the, the Canadian government you know basically saying they have Israel's back while 44 Palestinians are killed not a single Israeli is killed of course and it's all about Israeli security not about Palestinian security um, that injustice from the Canadian government is on top of a whole long list of, of uh, contributions to, uh, to Palestinian dispossession that, that both the federal government has, has, uh, is responsible for, and also you know, the, the Zionist movement in this country, uh, uh, you know, more in, in, the, uh, in the private sphere. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll leave, leave it at that. Oh, and I guess I should also say there, has, there is some resistance. You know, on Saturday night, there was a demonstration here in Montreal on announced in 24 hours notice. Um, more, more than 100 people attended to uh, call on the Canadian government to condemn what, is it, what Israel is doing and, and to, uh, you know, one of the chants was uh, uh, Israel terrorist Canada complice. Uh, and, uh, and I know there are, I've seen some posts about uh, protests planned in, in other cities in the coming days. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And if people have any uh, questions, comments, or criticisms, uh, we can uh, we can go to that uh, that part of the uh, of the uh, of the session. Go ahead, Laura. So, have the NDP or Greens or any of them come out, or even any Liberals within it come out, with calling for you know speaking up about what's happened to Palestine or Israel, or are they all uniformly just? No, they're not all uniform. Um, the Heather McPherson today, also mm -hmm. uh, alongside the, the the tweet I don't agree with on Taiwan, put out a you know pretty good tweet about Palestinian children that have been killed, uh, getting a lot of flack for doing that. Uh, Matthew Green put out a tweet. Uh, another NDP MP, uh, I believe that uh, Leah, Gaz Leah Gazan put out a tweet. Um, one of the liberal. Um, she might even be a minister, a, a lesser minister, um, forgetting her name right now. Uh, in the, I think she's in, in the Toronto area. I, I think she's uh, Muslim uh, uh, or maybe Arab background, but uh, she, she put out a, 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 a tweet critical. She's getting, she getting a lot of heat for it. Um, she was also uh, uh, photographed with some pro-Palestinian uh, people. One of them had a sign that said something to the effect of "condemn, condemn the the, uh, the Palestinian Holocaust" or yeah, "condemn the Palestinian Holocaust." And all the pro-Israel groups are having a freak out that <clears throat> you know you can only use the word "Holocaust" to refer to uh, to Hitler's uh, crimes against. Uh, European jury, um, but uh, yeah, so there's been a, there's been a bit of a bit of a bit of dissent. I, I didn't I haven't looked at um, the uh, Elizabeth May. I, I think that it's very good chance that Elizabeth May will will if she hasn't already put out a tweet that she would put out a tweet. So there's a few uh, you know there's a few NDP MPs willing to um, to oppose, uh, um, but uh, but yeah, the, but the the uh, the uh, the media attention hasn't been very significant, and uh, and the uh, like I said that statement from the from the official account was um, was uh, um, justifying it. Go ahead, uh, I think Sherry, or, or Yuri. Go ahead, Yuri. Okay, uh, the, the Sherry can go first if she has a question. She, I, oh, I saw that. I thought she had a question before. Or somebody. <laughs> Let me just see. I saw somebody else had a question before, and then it and then maybe it's disappeared. But go go ahead, go ahead, Yuri. 
Okay. <laughs> well, uh, Eve, thank you again for an, for 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 another brilliant uh, presentation. I really enjoy uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. Well, since well, you know, since uh, you know, you you were talking about Gaza, you know, I have to you know then ask this question. I believe I asked you this question a long time ago uh, when when Dmitry was running for the Green Party of Canada. Which is, you know, given that Israel, you know, continues to put their illegal settlements in the West Bank, and given that, you know, Gaza has been crippled by this monstrous, you know, economic, uh, em you know, embargo, uh, what hope is there really for 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 uh, for you know for Palestine, uh, especially with, you know, Israel just seems to be to, to keep getting more and more ultra Zionists and so forth. So I'm, I'm just wondering, like, what hope really is there for, for even, you know, the very just, uh, you know, one secular democratic uh, uh, solution? Yeah, I, I don't really know. Um, I, I do know that, uh, you know, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Gaza, <clears throat> Palestinians have few options in Gaza. I mean, they, they can, you know, the March and return protests in 2018, 2019 were, you know, nonviolent and, you know, they just, just snipers were just blowing out people's kneecaps and, you know, they killed 200 and, you know, no Israeli was, was killed. And, uh, you know, they, they, you know, they shot Canadian doctors and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Right. So, uh, many medical people that had clear medical uh, um, you know, jackets and whatnot. So, so Palestinians are kind of in a bind. I mean, they really, the only thing they can do is they can try um, some sort of, you know, this shooting of rockets to try to uh, cause a certain amount of, of, of uh, making life a little bit more difficult in parts of Israel as a way to hope that Israelis sort of you know, tune into the, uh, the blockade. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult position for Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, so much of this, in my opinion, come is, is, you know, we have so much capacity to change the dynamics, right? Um, you know, if, if the Canadian and U.S. governments uh, stopped enabling this, this, you know, I don't think, you know, you're not, you're not, we're not getting like full justice, right? Full justice is not, you know, in the plausible picture anytime, <laughs> anytime soon, but degrees of, degrees of injustice can be, can be lessened. And certainly, uh, you know, no more bombing campaigns in Gaza would be a pretty big step in the right direction. Uh, you know, having Palestinians control over their, their coastline uh, would be a step in, right? You can say, you know, and, and so, the, you know, ending the blockade or steps, um, you know, a one state, all this kind of stuff, this seems very far removed from, from the re reality of here and now. It's not, personally, it's not like how I, I don't, I don't come at this issue from based upon my opinion of, 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 you know, how that, piece of land should be, uh, should be, you know, politically governed, uh, you know, for the next, you know, next hundreds of years. I come at it more from how is the Canadian government enabling something that's so, so clearly unjust, uh, you know, the, the solution I, you know, I, I certainly like the idea of uh, one state with, uh, you know, equal rights and stuff like that. That seems what, what would make sense to me is a, is a, you know, what, what, but, but I don't, I don't, I think that there's, um, there's too much effort uh, put on to that, those questions and not enough effort to like, you know, there's recruitment going on for the Israeli military right now. Uh, you know, what I posted, what I posted in response to the liberal MP that was like saying that basically kind of like I cry for the children that are being harmed by uh, what's going on and sort of kind of criticizing what Israel is doing, but in a sort of a little bit unclear kind of way. 
It's like, well, just uphold Canadian law, right? Just you're, you know, you're in the liberal government, just call on the government, uphold Canadian law by ending, by pursuing those who recruit for the Israeli military in contravention of the Foreign Enlistment Act. Do that. Just even announce it. You don't even, you, ultimately, if you, you know, if a, a full on legal battle ends up happening or not, I don't, it, 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 you know, that would be better, but announce that you're going to do that, that, that no more, you know, what Israel's doing, no more foreign recruitment, and announce that the Canada Revenue Agency is going to uphold its rules around support for foreign militaries, support for uh, West Bank settlements, and support for explicitly racist organizations. In all these cases, there's all this money going by registered Canadian charities, subsidized with Canadian taxpayer, that's going to groups that already by what's on the books right now, not, we don't have to bring in any new laws about Canada Revenue Agency or, or you know, federal government laws that just that should should basically make a whole bunch of these charities um, lose their charter status overnight. And this is not this is not saying they you know we're not talking about throwing them in jail. We're just talking about no longer being subsidized by the Canadian government, no longer providing tax receipts for donations. That's all we're saying, right? It's a it's a very very low bar, but. But the, the extent to which Canada enables Palestinian dispossession is that even upholding our own laws, I mean, and the same thing goes with the whole, uh, you know, the wine case, right? And, and, and properly labeling uh, uh, wines. I mean, that was what the whole battle that uh, David Kattenberg and uh, Dimitri Lascaris and, and, and others have been, have been involved with, was just having the Canadian Inspection Agency properly label the wines, right? And they're trying to like basically obscure that they're, you know, settle, settlement wines coming into Canada. So, so um, the bar is quite frankly, pretty low. Uh, so the, you know, but the, but the, the upside to that is that I'm of the opinion, I, I think that the, uh, to some extent, the, some, some elements of the Palestine solidarity movement, um, I think there's some tactical I have some tactical kind of disagreement. I, I'm of the opinion that we should be absolutely hard line and direct about what Zionism has been and is. So no, no sugarcoating it. This is not that, oh, something happened in 1967 and then it went bad. And, you know, no, this from the get go was a European colonial movement. They at one point were trying to take out, you know, take territory in Kenya. Uh, it only succeeds because of its alignment with the British Empire. Uh, you know, it's been driving Palestinians from their homes since before uh, 47, 48. I mean, you know, the whole process of dispossession begins before that. It's been incredibly violent. You know, we should be absolutely clear with what Zionism has been. But our, our demands, our political focus should be as, as sort of mainstream as possible, which is uphold Canadian law, right? Just uphold Foreign Enlistment Act, uphold Canada Revenue Agency rules. That to me, um, sometimes where, you know, it gets into this, like, we're going to boycott, I, again, I, I'm totally supportive of it. I'm totally sympathetic to, to, the, to the ethos, but I, I think that I'm not sure that always it's the, the right uh, uh, tactical uh, decision. I think some of, the, some of the cultural boycott campaigning around international artists and not going to Israel, I think that has been effective and and even if it's not necessarily always the greatest from a popular education standpoint, it, 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 it does build some power. It, it forces open some questions and, and stuff like that. But I think some of the other, um, some of the other campaigns around boycotting stuff is, is it's not connected to the actual political reality of North America. We're so deeply complicit. It, there's so many ways in which you're complicit that when we, we get to the point of we're talking about like boycotting some company, I mean, again, our own laws right now, they're on the books, just, just uphold those laws rather than getting to the point of, you know, boycotting this. Right. Anyways, that was a very long and roundabout kind of response. <laughs> but, uh, but go ahead, uh, go ahead, I think, uh, Laurel. I think you're Muted, on Laurel. mute still. Laurel Thompson, you're on mute, I think. Left lower corner, where you see the mute. Yeah. Or it was you, Laura. You 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 were ahead of me. Go ahead of me. No, no, you haven't asked a question yet. So you go ahead. 
what I was going to say is, I mean, following along with this approach of um, forcing the Canadian government to uphold the law, I don't know where this would fit in, but I looked up that article in Canadian Dimension that I think you mentioned, uh, which talks about how arms sales to Israel have been on the upswing over the last little while. And that they sell they sell quite a bit of quite a bit of, of arms to to Israel. I read somewhere else that Canada is the second largest supplier of arms to the Middle East, and I and I would imagine that the Israeli arms sales is a big part of that. That's not illegal, but but it's they're not they're not they're not selling arms to Palestinians. They're yeah, selling them. To Israel. Make a good case that the the arms sales to to Israel do contravene Canadian law because there there are uh, arms control measures that that state that countries that are violating human rights and in conflict that they shouldn't be getting weapons. Okay. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know the you know the the specific wording of that and the legalese of that and that and that goes it's not just about Israel of course like we're you know send, selling weapons to the Saudis while they're you know waging war in Yemen right and but but I, but they're they're there have many, multiple, multiple commentators and stories that have, you know, talked about how that the what, the sales to Saudi Arabia should contravene Canada's uh, regulations, and uh, and there was even a court case. I think it got thrown out, but around the arms trade treaty that um, that uh, that professor, I think, uh, here in Montreal, uh, brought around that, I believe. Uh, to to Saudi Arabia, so so you can you can make a case. I you know like I, I'm not the one to make that case because I don't know all the ins and outs of it. But but um, but yeah, even weapons, the weapons sales to Israel at this point are are there. You know they they I think the campaign that <clears throat> uh, CJPME Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East are doing on that is is good and it and it very much aligns. You know the NDP that was what was won one of the parts of what was won in the uh, the, for the Palestine resolution at the last uh, convention, which was a pretty significant victory uh, for the Palestine Solidarity Movement. And, um, you know, the Jagmeet Singh in last May did stand up in the House of Commons and, you know, say we should stop selling weapons to Israel. Canada doesn't actually send that, I mean, sell that much weapons to Israel. Uh, Israel Israel is the, is the big, we import more from Israel. Israel is the big, you know, it's a very thriving uh, uh, arms industry. The weapons demand is, I think, quite useful from the standpoint of the fact that it's again, it's a pretty, it's a, it's it's simple. It's not complicated. The the demand is very simple, and it is some form of sanction on what Israel is doing. Uh, uh, so, and it fits with you know when when attacked, when the NDP was attacked for for you know criticizing Israel, Jagmeet Singh's response was. Well, we've called for you know arms embargoes on other countries as well. So how dare you know? How can you claim we're being you know anti-Semitic for 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 making that um, uh, putting forth that position? So so but but actually, if you go back historically, Canada did provide. I mean, Canada provided weapons to this to the Zionist forces in in, in forty eight, right? It, it was actually it was kind of kind of covertly, but they actually had officials within within the, um, the federal government that were supporting. Uh, even though officially we weren't supposed to be sending weapons, uh, and then and then after Israel's creation, there's significant Canadian weapons deliveries uh, to Israel. I talked about it in that last piece. While Israel's killing people in Gaza and mm-hmm. continuing to you know uh, um, you know kill kill Egyptian civilians or Egyptian soldiers as well. Um, and that was at a time when Israel was way, way more dependent. When Israel was way, way weaker, and those those arms uh, sales were were quite, quite, quite significant and quite controversial, even within the Canadian government. Um, so, so yeah, there's a there's a there's a history there. But yes, the the I think the you know the call for ending weapons uh, is a one that we should definitely um, uh, pick up. And again, I, I think it's one that you can even make a, a legal case. That it does contravene the the um, arms control measures that the Canadian government uh, um, mm-hmm. has on the books. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I, I'm not sure if it's is it Laura or 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 Yuri. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Laura. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to deviate from my original question, but I just want to ask a little bit about tactics, because I know that funding of elections in Canada is surely different from the U.S. So in the U.S., anyone, you know, displays any empathy for Palestinians at all, and money just comes in from Jewish support groups and maybe Christian support groups and just demolishes them. So, you know, you, you almost just can't express uh, empathy for the Palestinians in most districts. Now, I'm assuming in Canada, with different funding of elections, maybe is that also an issue or not? So that was it. And the other question I had on tactics on the other side is from what you just said, I get a feeling that maybe you're not, you don't think supporting or promoting support for BDS is a particularly winning strategy, but it has been gaining momentum, particularly amongst the young in North America. And I've just, so those were the two tactics I wondered about. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I, I support the boycott, the rest of the sanctions movement. I, I, I don't think when, um, I'm forgetting his name right now, who is the main person uh, with the BNC in Palestine, uh, Barghouti, uh, I'm forgetting his first name, when he spoke in Montreal. I think, uh, oh, I think, I think Omar Barghouti, yeah, I could be wrong though. Yeah. Yeah. In 2006, 2007, he spoke and kind of early on in the BDS movement, get it going. And he made the he made the point that that the campaigns that are chosen or targets or this are need to be politically specific to wherever you are. Mm -hmm. So, if you're in Ireland and your your focus is you know boycotting I don't know exactly but like you know boycotting Israeli oranges, okay? Ireland doesn't have the level of in, in the vicinity, I'm sure if you got into it, I'm sure there's much more than I know, but in the vicinity of complicity in Palestinian dispossession that Canada has, right? Like there isn't, there aren't all these charities, there aren't like hundreds of charities that are subsidized by a taxpayer that are supporting every possible thing you could think of in Israel. Like, it, like the symphony, the, the, you know, the, the Tel Aviv symphony, there's a Canadian friends of the Tel Aviv Symphony. symphony. The, do, the, the one I, I laughed about the most was, a, was like friends of Israeli guide dog societies, right? So there's a registered Canadian charity sending money. So ta Canadian taxpayers subsidizing, for, you know, this is, this is like, so, so if we talk about like, you know, boycotting, you know, is, Israeli oranges into, into Canada, it's like, it's not con it's not connected to the actual political reality of 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 what we're you know involved. In. So I'm I'm totally supportive. I think that the the what the BDS movement the you know, important part of what BDS movement has done is the sort of framing of what the conflict is over. And you know it's not just about 1967 borders. This is about equal rights. This is about racism. This is about European. This is about colonialism and and this stuff. Okay, so that I'm completely. So that's why I say. I don't, I'm not, I'm not arguing that, that, that you know, we don't, don't, I'm not arguing for sugarcoating what Zionism is. In fact, I, I believe that, you know, I think we should even go further. I think the, the business about it just being some like defensive movement against European anti-Semitism of, of the late 1800s, that's bull, that's, that's, you know, there's an element of truth to that, but it was a colonial, it, it comes out of European nationalism, right? That's taking place at the time. It comes out of the height of European imperialism, the scramble for Africa in the late 1800s. That's what it comes out of. Yes, there is a defensive component about about you know um, uh, about anti-Semitism, but overwhelming. I mean, there was anti-Semitism before that time. Why didn't that manifest in that way, right? It manifests in, in that way at that time because again, it's the height of European uh, 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 imperialism. There's also a Christian Zionist element to it all. So I think we should be absolutely clear about what you know the the horrors and the the uh, injustices of Zionism. So that element, I'm completely in support of of the BDS. I just think that we need to be um, tactically specific to our location, and I, I think it's a little disconnected. The a big part of what BDS um, kind of gets going on is a little bit disconnected from the actual you know Canadian reality, and I think it's partly because people don't know the Canadian reality. Right? They don't. They don't know. They're not, they don't. They don't know how complicit we are and how complicit, complicit we've been since you know the Jewish National Fund of Canada was set up in you know 1910 to steal Palestinian land, right? And that you know Canadian politicians were were supporting that you know more than a century ago, right? Um, 
so uh yeah that's part of it and there was a uh, yeah in terms of in terms of the, the 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 fundraising thing i mean what we've seen in the us in the last couple of weeks is absolutely insane right what apac and the democratic um was a democratic majority for israel what they have done with with pumping in huge amounts of money into democratic primaries what they did to uh, Levin, I forget uh, his first name. He is a he is a president of a synagogue, but and he's a Zionist. He's a liberal Zionist, but because he put forward a, a resolution last year that that said there should be you know we should take this two state serious two state solution seriously and there should be some consequence. Don't even don't know specific. I'm sure it was a very very mild. Andy uh, Levin. Andy Levin. Andy Levin. And, but I think this may be the thing that angered APEC even more, was that because when, when uh, Ilan Omar and um, uh, Rashidi, uh, I'm forgetting the first name right now, uh, when, when they got attacked as being anti-Semitic, he defended them. And because he you know, was a president of a synagogue, his defense provided you know, like a little bit more kind of uh, clout. They pumped in more than 4 million bucks for a democratic primary to defeat him. They, like, and, and, and in Rashidi's district, what they did, one of the things they did, what they didn't, she, she, she was like, so, you know, she, they were, it was very unlikely. So they put a lot less money into her trying to, trying to defeat her. But one of the things they did was they, they, they got, they set up this, this uh, group that was about, all about like black participation. So her, her, her district is like 60% black or, you know, heavily black. And so, and so they, they, they framed it all about like black participation. And, and so, and then they got behind a black candidate. So they frame it in this like, sort of like, you know, racial justice kind of, kind of direction as they're like, you know, backing apart. And the other part of the, the craziness of all this is they don't talk about Israel, right? Yeah. Just Never. Take out of the whole yeah. discussion. So the whole motivation is Israel, or the overwhelming motivation is Israel, but they don't even bring it up, right? Because they know the actual among democratic, uh, registered Democrats, now Israel has become, you know, increasingly sort of toxic. And so, so, so they, they, all the, their motivation, and that once they've defeated a candidate, and they, unfortunately, they were very, they, uh, there's some seven of nine people they target, they really heavily target, they actually succeeded. And unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a reality. And, and it's something, I don't know the full number, I think something like $40 million into Democratic primaries uh, to, um, that, nothing like that exists in Canada. Nothing like that. Uh, yeah, you know, f uh, donations matter and, you know, some, but it's all, it's, it, you know, the U.S. is completely unique, um, at least among the, the uh, you know, uh, G7 countries in that the, you know, financial contributions being allowed to be so openly, uh, you know, sway elections and stuff like that. Um, there are, there are, you know, the Israel lobby, uh, uh, you know, there's other ways in which they're effective in terms of the organizing that, that, you know, fundraising is not, uh, not a central part of it, but no, what's happened in the US, I mean, what, like, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't think what's happened, this intervention by APAC over the past couple of months in, in democratic primaries, basically the, the objective here is to wipe out the left. I mean, really, even people who weren't even really, um, uh, uh, Nina, Nina Turner, who is not really like, you know, not really pro-Palestinian. I mean, not, I think she would be, you know, but like not active at all on the issue. They pumped in tons of money to defeat her just because she was identified with the squad, right? And she was identified as, you know, and so, so that the thinking was is that if she, she you know, she would get in, into, she would just sort of go along with that kind of ethos. Really what it was is like, you know, destroy those forces that, that are, are trying to, you know, give us a chance of not being, you know, the species being eliminated by the climate crisis. Uh, there's forces that are, you know, saying that the, the, the you know, shocking uh, economic inequality is, you know, something that we should, we should challenge. I mean, they're really trying to destroy the, you know, the, I mean, the left of the Democratic Party, which in my opinion is not very left, of course. Uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty, uh, pretty shocking, uh, pretty shocking development. Uh, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Yuri. Yeah, then one, then, then one, one, one follow-up question I have to ask is, 
are you, is, is is are you still shocked at how the uh, the the anti semitism smear campaign still works and how cowardice uh, people still are at calling uh, you know part of my language but calling bullshit to a smear campaign even when uh, there are countless uh, you know. Jewish uh, anti-Zionist voices and 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 and, and, pe and people within you know Jewish communities who want to you know speak out and want others to break their sides. Are you so stunned that somebody like Bernie Sanders can reject BDS and says, "Oh, I don't believe in the, in the one democratic state solution." And on top of you know, uh, you know, I was a you know reporter for Black and Gender Report and I covered the Labor Party conference when uh, just at the peak when it got worse and worse and worse. What was what was but, 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 but what was more scandalous was that Jeremy Corbyn and his team did not call BS to 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 to, to a smear campaign when they could have easily have like you know demolished it due to the fact that so many people who were being slandered and kicked out of the Labour Party were you know Jewish anti-Zionist voices. So yeah, are you are you so shocked at uh, you know at that state of affairs? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously shocking. I mean, yeah, in the in the Labour Party, what, what the whole like uh, the driving out ended up being like a, a disproportionately driving out like Jewish Jewish members of the Labour Party. That's what the anti-Semitism fight was. I mean, that, that was like the, the numbers are, you know, the are there that people can take a look at. So, yeah, I mean, but it's uh, I mean, go online and look at uh, Heather McPherson. I just, uh, you know, an hour before this looking at Heather McPherson's the uh, NDP woman, right? Foreign Affairs critic. Her her tweet, which you know, it's just about like Palestinian children. It's absolutely. I mean, she should be going, you know, twenty times farther and calling out the injustice. And there's just a whole bunch of people just are like, you you know, NDP anti-Semitism. You're an anti-Semite. This and that. You know, and so it, the clearly the Israel lobby has. Um, they, they're, it's harder and harder to make the case for Israel. And increasingly, the, the anti-Semitism charge is, is what they, that's their strong play, right? And, you know, they, I mean, Trudeau set up the, uh, the special envoy, you know, they have a special envoy that's Erwin Kotler. I mean, like, you know, it's just like, it, it, it's, it's, it's calm, at one level, it's comical, but it it completely works in the in the uh, in the dominant media and and quite frankly in you know large swaths of the left, right? I mean I we, you know talking about like Bernie Farber and uh, the Canadian Anti Hate Network, and this is somebody who's you know he he labeled like I mean he labeled QP anti Semitic labeled Israeli apartheid uh, or sorry. Um, uh, Pride Toronto uh, anti-Semitic for allowing queers against Israeli apartheid. This is somebody who you know who leads the Canada Anti-Hate Network, and you. This is somebody who's like you know deep, deeply, deeply full of Palestinians, and that never gets called out. Um, but yeah, no, I mean the 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 anti-Semit anti-Semitism smear is uh, is uh, is is effective in, in large part because it aligns with power, right? And Israel is still viewed as a, you know, U.S. outpost and that, um, that uh, you know, so, so f that's sort of, uh, but yeah, I don't know how, I don't know where, I don't know when it will end. I think at one point it will end. I mean, people, I think every day people catch on to, to what's going on, but it's a, you know, it's a slow process and, and, and it's, um, Palestinians are the primary victims, but I actually think that, you know, increasingly it's just the left in general, right? And, and, um, and there's a lot of, the, you know, sort of a kind of identity politics um, uh, language and, and uh, ethos is something that, that the, the apartheid lobby has done quite a good job of sort of like connecting into and um, and um, sort of uh, playing off of, um, so it's um, yeah. I don't, I don't know where I don't know where the end point is for that. I mean, you know, all movements challenging power are smeared in one way or another, right? And so this is you know the long you know red baiting whatever, right? Um, 
So that's just something that you you deal with when 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 challenging uh, power. But I, but I do think it's kind of uh, remarkable how much of uh, even sort of progressive minded, even people who sort of you know kind of getting like understand that Palestinians are being mistreated. Um, like 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 Barbara Barbara Perry was that her name? Who, who's done like a lot of studies on like far right act, uh, activism and stuff like that, right? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I think that's a, like, there's an element to that, but I think it, it, it's remarkable, quite frankly, how many people who say they're involved in anti-racism act, activism in Canada, they say they're fighting fascists and anti-racism activism who are, are willing to work with apartheid lobby, right? <laughs> like, I mean, you know, and like, or, or, or like the, the Jewish National Fund. I mean, the Jewish National Fund what it does is it excludes non-Jews from the land it owns. We had in Canada, that existed in Canada, right? There was all kinds of uh, racist uh, property covenants into the 1950s. There's still stories that every, every, every so often there's some like house sold in like West Vancouver, the really you know, wealthy part of uh, Vancouver, um, where they, they find in the property deed, it says this, this house can, can, can only be sold to those of the white race and no, uh, no Chinese people, no black people, no Jewish people, no whatever, right? Like that, they still, that, those stories come up every so often. There was legal cases that outlawed that in Canada 60, you know, in the, in the, in the mid 1950s. Yet that's what the Jew, that's what the Jewish National Fund does in Israel. It's not it's not it's not hidden, right? The Israeli Supreme Court has said, even said that, and yet it's a registered charity, and yet anti-racism organizations never talk about it in Canada, right? And so um, you know that that so I think that's a sl slightly distinct. I mean, it's tied into, but it's slightly distinct from the whole question of of how effective the charge of anti-Semitism is. To, to scaring people, right? It doesn't necessarily change people's minds. I think in, in, a, in a macro sense it does, but it scares people from, you know, saying what's on their mind vis-a-vis uh, -vis Palestinians, uh, right? And so, and that collectively sort of has a, has a you know, has an impact. Uh, but. I think you also had a question, E, from, from, a, from, from an Anne Wolka co, but, by, by, but her hand's uh, now down, yeah, but. Saw, yeah. So Anne, Anne, uh, go ahead, Anne. May I? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, it's it's Anne Walco. Um, yeah. I, I just the, I just realized as we spoke about uh, the trope. I'm going to call it a trope that you know to be anti-Israel is to be anti-Semitic. It started 50 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, with an Israeli foreign minister who was very well known, Abba Iban, and I think he's the first one to be credited with 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 that equation. Um, maybe it's just a, a given that any Israeli politician would have argued that way, but I think he's the one who's to be credited with it. Um, and maybe there's not much to be made of that, but um, um, it's just, I'm, the violence, I mean, 16 children out of, I believe 45 deaths this weekend, 16. The, the 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 ratio is even worse than ever and uh i'm just so dis i don't know what to do anymore and i'm gonna stop talking yeah i mean i think i think what what we need to do is to is to keep campaigning right we we like the campaigning is effective the campaigning has i mean you know mcgill 71 percent of mcgill students voting for palestine solidarity resolution criticizing uh, apartheid and settler colonialism by Israel and calling for divestment and boycotting at McGill of companies, you know, that's, that's something that's new. That's, there's, I had this conversation with the, with the, um, the editor at the McGill Tribune a couple of days ago, who's the, generally the, the right-wing paper, the McGill Daily has actually like five or six years ago, the McGill Daily, they have a whole ethical policies and that they've been doing for decades. And one of the, the, don't know the specifics, but basically they said they're not, they no longer accept pro-Zionist uh, perspectives because that, that Zionism is, is a form of racism and that goes against their long-standing policies. 
so so you know I knew that about the McGill Daily, but talking this McGill Tribune, which is the you know again the right wing paper, you know, she was totally sympathetic to to the uh, the solidarity for Palestinian human rights at McGill, and and that's this is something that changed. You know, like back when I was at university, this is not how this is not the outlook, and so I do think I think there really has been there's a there's a generation, really is a generational divide on on some of these things and. And that you know the, the generational divide doesn't didn't fall from the sky, right? Like the, the reason why I um, started understanding about the Palestinian cause, I, mean, like I think I said it I've said it recently, uh, but like you know, I was literally walking down at Concordia down the escalator, and a guy's handing out the um, a booklet on on Palestine, you know, what's going on in Palestine. It's twenty years ago, and I go and sit and read it at a at a pizza shop, and that's my oh, this is I didn't know this, and and so and that's right, and so it's it's the activism. You know, when are, when are we going to hit? When when is the tipping point? I don't know, and um, you know, it's not it's not mostly us that is that that you know feel the pain from the from the um, not hitting that tipping point of of being determined policy. Obviously, mostly Palestinian, but yeah, it is. It's you know, it's difficult. Some some points you want to sort of disengage from the hor the horribleness of it all, but you know, I think it's. Uh, it's our uh, responsibility to do what we can to uh, lessen the Canadian government's uh, uh, contribution to that um, that dispossession. And, and I guess I shouldn't say I'm despondent. I do see the change. I, in about I don't know. I guess I've been aware um, since uh, Arafat died is the time when I began to become aware. And I do see the change. I'm going to cough, so I'm going to stop again. Sorry. So uh, thanks everyone. And uh, uh, next week, uh, same place, same time. Have a good night. Okay. Uh, see ya. No.